بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا ومولانا وحبيبنا محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Thank you الحمد لله for being here sisters I know uh, it's uh, midweek and we still have work and other commitments so it's always an honor to have you here الحمد لله for those who are also watching on live stream just to refresh your memories we are working or we are reading from purification of the heart in this class and alhamdulillah today we are going to be talking about a topic that we all need to really revisit over and over again especially in today's world in fact to be honest all of the diseases of the heart um, are are relevant they're present we all to a certain degree have likely all of them um, and we need to come to <laughs> come to that understanding inshallah and also heed the warning of many of our teachers that this is among the um, the sciences that are considered or uh, uh, you know obligatory for us to constantly renew our intentions and to purify and to not see you know to, to basically read this as often as possible or read through it and, and really never abandon this science because every day we're tested in different ways so the topic we're going to talk about today is envy and usually what I do is I read from the book and then provide commentary uh, for you know, as, as it uh, pertains to the text or, or any st stories that I have to share. We will likely take a break. I think Aisha comes in around 8 o'clock. So we'll take a break for Aisha, and then we can come back and do some Q&A or have any discussions you, you want to have, inshallah. So bismillah. With that said, I'll read from the verses of the poem. Uh, well, I'm on page 27, if you have the book, alhamdulillah. So envy. If you were to describe your desire that someone lose his blessing as envy, then your description will be accurate. In other words, if you yourself were able, through some ruse, to eliminate someone's blessing, you would utilize that ruse to do so. But if the fear of God, the eternally besought, prevents you from doing so, then you are not an envious person. This is what the proof of Islam, Imam al-Ghazali, rahimahullah, ex expected with hope from the bounty of the possessor of majesty and generosity. He said that whoever despises envy, such that he loathes it in himself, is safeguarded from fulfilling what it customarily necessitates. So the definition. Envy, or hasad, is a severe disease of the heart that some scholars hold to be the root of all diseases, while others opine that the parent disease goes back to covetousness, pama. Regardless of where envy ranks in the hierarchy of diseases, most scholars agree that it is the first manifestation of wrongdoing and the first cause of disobedience against God. It occurred when Satan, Iblis, refused to obey God when commanded to bow down before the new creation, Adam, the first human being. Nothing prevented Iblis from bowing down except his envy of Adam, for God chose Adam to be his vicegerent on earth instead of him. Iblis arrogantly objected to the command that he show Adam any honor, for Iblis saw himself a creation from fire, superior to Adam, created merely from clay. When confronted with his disobedience, Satan did not seek forgiveness from God, Enviers develop a mindset that makes it impossible for them to admit they are wrong. To manifest envy is to manifest one of the characteristics of the most wretched creature, Satan. In Arabic, hasud or hasid is one who carries and emanates this envy. And the object of one's envy is called mahsud. The Quran teaches us to seek refuge in God from the evil of the envier, hasid, when he envies in uh, Surah Al-Falaq, uh, 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 Chapter 5. The Prophet ﷺ said that envy consumes good deeds the way fire devours dry wood. The Prophet ﷺ also said, every possessor of any blessing is envied. Someone of means will have someone who envies him for what he possesses. Even a street sweeper may be envied. If he owns a donkey to pull his cart, and another street sweeper has no donkey and has to pull his cart. This can be a cause for envy. So, I mean, right away we can see that this is 
again, as I mentioned, very relevant uh, disease. And it's also one of those that if you're not paying attention to your thoughts, um, it can creep up, right? Um, and, you know, you may, you may uh, experience it in, in, in two ways. One, where, where you have envy for someone, right? You may see someone that has a blessing that you want, that you have been pining for or yearning for or making da. So you may be susceptible to being the envier, right? Where you are looking to someone, wondering, you know, um, you know how they got what they want, or I'm sorry, how they got what they have uh, that you want. Um, and you may start to, you know, become almost, if, especially in the world of social media that gives us access to kind of peer into people's lives, right? We can go and, and look at their life. And in some cases, people have become very open with the most private aspects of their, their life, which is honestly very interesting if you think about a time before social media, right? And some of us are old enough to remember what that was like, where people didn't just have access to your private life. They had to be very close and they had to actually come over to your house to actually see, you know, the way that you lived, your family, your possessions. But now from a remote area all the way across the world, some random stranger you've never met in your life before can know very intimate details. So we may have fallen into this uh, very um, seductive trapping of social media where we, because we are curious about a person's possessions, for example, if you hear that a, a relative of yours went on a fancy vacation, right? The rumor mill, someone mentioned, oh, they got, they went on this cruise or this other vacation. And you're like, oh, really? How'd you hear about it? Well, they posted it all over their social media. So what do we do? We race to their account to go check out the footage, to check out the pictures, right? And what is the point of that? The point of that is, you know, I haven't been on a vacation in a long time. I've been stuck working. I don't think I'll be able to go anywhere for a while. I have obligations. I can't afford it. So let me live in a way vicariously through this person's, you know, personal life. And so you go down that rabbit hole and you end up not just on one picture or one, you know, story, but maybe you go through more, you know, there's sometimes little captions that are, you know, uh, that are again calling us. So we, we go click on a bunch of buttons and next, you, you just waste so much time. But that's how envy works. It's a very... You know, unless you're paying attention to your behavior and why you're doing what you're doing, you can fall into these types of thoughts, right? And and that can end in, in certain ways. Maybe if, if you're inshallah, your heart is, is, you're working on your heart. Maybe yes, there's a little bit of a, you know, a slight um, pain because you haven't been somewhere, but you're, you're genuinely happy for them. Alhamdulillah, happy for them, happy that they had a good time. And maybe it ends there. Or maybe uh, you're annoyed because... You know, you don't like, you know, one or both of them or the whole lot of them. And now you're allowing your heart to develop even more diseases. And that's why, you know, as was mentioned, this is considered the root of the diseases because it can lead to other diseases. So we have to be very careful of engaging in these things that have been so normalized in our society. But from our faith perspective, we're actually very low things, you know, wanting to know people's private business is actually antithetical to Islam, right? Because the Prophet ﷺ said, what? Very clearly, to mind your own business. So when we go down those paths that peering into people's lives, becoming like what we used to call them back when I was younger, a peeping Tom, right, voyeurism, it is actually indicative of a problem internally if you do that. So you have to kind of be aware of yourself. Like, what is it? Why am I so curious? Am I just, you know, busybody, nosy person that wants to know other people's business? For, to what end? How is that helping my life, right? If I am just engaging in that behavior. But again, when something is normalized and you see it off, you know, done on, on such a large scale, everybody kind of does it and nobody thinks twice about it, then you may not realize how repugnant it is until you go back to the deen and you realize, like, subhanAllah, we're not even, we shouldn't, I mean, our, I remember one of our teachers said that his father ingrained this in him to, uh, to such a degree that I believe he was in the streets of Damascus, Syria, and um, if there was like a car accident or a fight happening, 
he would remind him, don't even look. You know, like the, the, the rubbernecker effect, right? You hear a noise and you, see, you, you hear something or you witness something. It's, it's human instinct. We want, we're curious. We want to look. But his point in teaching him that was this whole thing. You can't do anything about that, right? It's, you're a little kid, basically. Don't have the habit of being that curious person who wants to know what's going on all the time with other people. Unless you're obviously, you, you have a good intention, you want to help them, that's different. But in this case, it was just one of the examples that he mentioned, that even to that degree of not falling into these habits of just wanting to look and notice and what's going on. And I've certainly caught myself, um, one example I think we've all probably experienced many times before is when you're in a gathering or in a khutbah, in a prayer hall, and you hear that, baby crying in the back, right? I, 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 um, I urge you or I, um, yeah, I'm going to put you to the test. I, I'll encourage you to try to fight the instinct to turn around. It's very difficult, right? Because especially if it's repeated and you're just like, where's the mom? Why isn't she taking care of this child? And you get frustrated, right? SubhanAllah, it happened to me recently and I completely, and, and Allah's my witness, I did this with this in mind because I said it's so unfair if these children, if I turn around, I'm going to have a negative opinion of, of them, right? I'm annoyed by the sound. I don't want to know who they are because it's not fair to them that I acknowledge them, I look at them, and then I imprint this negative thought in my heart toward them, and the next time I avoid them, right? They're children, they're being children, let them be. I've had that happen on a flight before, same thing, where it's like, nope, no matter how much I want to turn around and give them a glare, <laughs> I'm not going to do that because I'm fighting my own nafs that, entitles me to think that I, you know, that everything should go according to my comfort. You know, people, we're existing on this planet with all of our fellow human beings and sometimes people have problems and can't they just exist or does everything have to go according to our comforts and our needs, right? So the entitlement of the nafs is what we're trying to also address here. So envy, again, is something that can affect us in that way where we are literally doing things or engaging in behaviors that will lead us to very dangerous paths. Or it could be the opposite, which is mentioned here, where we are so unaware of this disease as being a real threat that we put ourselves out there and lead uh, and, and allow ourselves and, or our families, our loved ones, to be susceptible to being afflicted by the, uh, the envy of other people, Right. And so this is the advice that was mentioned at the end here, that every possessor of any blessing is envied. So when you have anything that's going good for you, whether it's your career or your relationship or your you know, health, you know, people, for example, will be very excited to share you know, um, whether it's you know, they've, they've lost weight or they're going to the gym and they're getting healthy or they went on a hike and they went this place and that place. And we, we fail to realize that there are a lot of people who, again, maybe on the other end of the screen looking into your life and they don't, they're not able to do those things. Or they could, maybe there was a point where they were able to, but they can't do it anymore. And so the point is, is not to fall into what we see now, again, in, in, in this time and place that we're all in, where people don't think about the consequences of oversharing, Right? Oversharing your blessings is putting yourself in threat, a threat. And the more private you are with your blessings, the greater the protection of that blessing. But when you put it out there, then be prepared for problems, right? Your relationship is, I would say, one of the most important things. I give this advice to couples all the time to please guard your relationship. No matter how wonderful it is, how wonderful your spouse is, your children are, you don't need to share that with a single soul, literally, other than showing a gratitude to your spouse, to your family, and of course to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as a, as a point of, of deep gratitude to Him for giving you that blessing. There's really no point in going around sharing it with anyone else. And as sad as it might seem to some people, even your closest family members can afflict you with hasad. I know people who have felt jealousy, envy from their own parents. So you imagine you're a young girl, your spouse, you married someone, you have a love marriage and your husband is buying you gifts left and right, taking you all over the place. 
If your mother did not have that experience with your father, right? Even though she's your mother, she loves you. It may enter her heart that, well, I never got that. And you may see or hear even a response that seems a little bit passive aggressive, maybe a little unkind. And a lot of people are on the other end of it. Like, wow, that was strange. Why, why did she say that? Or she didn't seem very happy for me. Right. This could be at play. And I think that's hard for a lot of people to um, accept that, that someone close to you, like your mother, your father, your siblings could potentially not be happy for your blessing, but it is that real, right? So we're reminded repeatedly to just safeguard your blessings. Don't be a braggart. Don't be a showboat. Don't go around flaunting whatever you have and do the opposite actually, which is to um, minimize your blessings when you're talking about other people, not as a means of being ungrateful, but rather don't put the focal point, don't be at the center, right? Don't spotlight yourself. When we are with other people, we should be more concerned with, uh, you know, benefiting them, right? Want for your brother what you want for yourself. Being a person who is interested genuinely in their well-being. Having, you know, conversations where you're not so self-centered. But there's something to be said about, again, the world that we live in when every opportunity you're out with people, whether it's, you know, one-on-one or in a group setting, And you want to keep bringing the conversation back to yourself. And then, you know, I'm sure we've all experienced that where there are some people who just seem to really want attention and they seek attention. So that's something that is just, again, not becoming of a believer because we should be more concerned with listening, learning, speaking about beneficial things, right? Uh, Outside of even the the, the personal individual, uh, you know, needs or or lives of, of the people involved, we should be talking about really important things, you know, that, that help us to move away from the nafsi state, right? So when you're, that's why we are encouraged to do the remembrance of Allah, to make sure that our knowledge uh, or that our discourse and our gatherings are, are beneficial. We're actually exchanging, you know, good information with each other. We're teaching, we're learning. So that, again, we get out of the nafsi state. So these are what we're encouraged to do. And that will really prevent and it will mitigate this issue of, of inviting people to know too many intimate details about your life, feeling the need to um, share and to flaunt in any way, even if it's because, you know, there's, if you, when you, when you go further down into the diseases, like you'll, we'll cover soon, diseases that relate to envy, right? For example, ostentation. Uh, Ostentation is where you show off your, Yourself. You know, you could show up your religious practice or otherwise, but you're basically showing off in order to impress people, in order to make a name for yourself. So this is the danger of these diseases. They're, they're, they are kind of interwoven, you know. And then there's suma, which is similar, but it's it's wanting renown. It's wanting reputation. It's wanting to, for people to know your accomplishments, right? So kind of dropping hints about, like, you know, where you work, you know, name dropping, for example, is a very classic example, right? That people like to let people know that I know this person or I've been here and I do this. That kind of behavior, again, is all inviting these diseases onto yourself. And that's why, I mean, in addition to compromising your Nia with Allah, that's the other danger is that you're inviting harm to yourself. So, you know, it's a, it's a very important part of this conversation is that we look at envy as two directional, you know, that you could be the one envying others for their blessings or being careless and then bringing envy into your life and then you wonder why are things not going well suddenly in your relationship. Um, And I know people who have had this exact same thing happen. I know someone who says that every single time she had ever posted about her relationship, like that night or the next day there was a fight and it's, you know, she eventually saw the pattern. Right? So it's like, oh, you know, we went to dinner, we went here, we went there, and then subhanAllah, out of nothing, there would come an argument with her spouse, and it would be like a cold war for days or weeks. Like, so you realize, like, subhanAllah, this is real, and the Prophet told us, you know, al-aynu haqqun, right? The, the evil eye is real. So we take these things very seriously. Um, alhamdulillah. So we'll, we'll continue. We're on page 28, um, the middle paragraph here. While it is believed that envy can bring about harm to the one envied, 
Ultimately, it is the envier who is harmed the most. The evil eye is generally related to envy, though not necessarily so. Some people simply have the eye, some type of psychic power that does not necessitate envy. Every culture has a concept of the evil eye. In some cultures, parents used to pierce the ears of their firstborn males and dress them as little girls for the first five years, since firstborn males were so coveted. Many Chinese conduct rituals to prevent the evil eye from afflicting their homes by placing mirrors on walls to reflect evil looks. The word invidious means envy, and it originally meant to look at something with a malevolent or evil eye. The Prophet wasallam said, The evil eye is true. Al-Aynu Haqqun. The evil eye is not superstition. The Prophet wasallam worked to eradicate superstition from the minds of people. For example, the Arabs believed that when the moon eclipsed, it meant that a great person died. When a lunar eclipse occurred on the day the Prophet wasallam's infant son Ibrahim died, many of the Arabs were impressed by this phenomenon. While a charlatan would have seized the moment to take advantage of such an event, the Prophet ﷺ announced to the people, The moon is a sign of God. The sun is a sign of God. They do not eclipse for anyone. Imam Maulud explains that envy is exhibited when one desires that another person lose a blessing he or she has. This loss could be anything, big or small a house, a car, a job, etc. For example, an envious person may become resentful that a co-worker was promoted to the point that he wishes that the person lose the position. A woman may envy another woman because of her husband such that she hopes that a marital crisis separate the couple. A man may grow envious over another man's wife. There are endless variations of envy but a common thread is the desire that someone lose a blessing. In essence, envy arises over what one perceives to be a blessing in someone else's possession. Again, this I've heard so many stories over the years about this, and it's, uh, it's really just unfortunate how people allow this disease, whether it comes from Again, wanting uh, something that someone else has or wanting someone to lose a blessing that they have just out of spite. You know, I've seen some really or heard some really evil stories uh, over the years. I remember one person, um, she said that she knew someone who basically did not like her daughter-in-law for whatever reason. I think, you know, maybe she was jealous of her or some, so that can happen, right? If a mother has what they call... Um, an emotionally incestuous relationship with with her son, uh, she may become quite threatened when he gets married, right? And so it can cause this type of jealousy, this type of envy to emerge because suddenly, you know, the, the son may start to give more attention to the wife than his mother. So in this case, the woman was so, Allah may Allah protect us from hearts like that, but she was uh, very upset that his wife had become um, pregnant, that she actually made a dua that she would lose her baby um, against her. And sure enough, she had a miscarriage. So this evil eye, this ability to wish ill on someone that can come from envy, but not always, is very real. You know, that, that some people have that ability. Um, it can come from evil, and it can also come from from just the person who's afflicted with this. You know, I know someone else personally who, uh, inshallah, she doesn't have it anymore, but there was a time where she believed very strongly that she had this, um, you know, this evil eye. And there were examples of it, you know. I mean, yeah, I, I just, the story, many, many stories, but one in particular comes to mind um, of a dress. A friend of mine was wearing a dress, and she, she looked very, mashallah, beautiful, and... Um, someone at a gathering had told her that, you know, her dress was very nice. And within seconds, she, I think, tripped her heel, got caught in it, and it started to unthread. So there's examples like that. And if you've, you know, I've, I've experienced uh, them speaking. I had someone once ask me before a speaking engagement if I was nervous. 
And Allahu Alam, I don't know, but I generally, you know, after speaking for almost 30 years, you don't get as nervous, you know. You kind of, you know, it's like riding a bike. You get better at it. So I, I answered confidently, like, no, I, I, I feel fine. And I did feel fine. And then I went up and I started making a lot of mistakes that were so odd for me that even people who heard me were like, are you okay? I was like, I have no idea what happened to me. Like, I had no nerves. Alhamdulillah, I did not feel nervous. But somehow I just started stumbling and making a lot of mistakes that were apparently odd. So things like that can happen. People can throw you off your game or whatever you want to call it. So the point is, is you know, this is these are real phenomena. And we can't, by the way, um, we shouldn't. We shouldn't let ourselves presume the worst of people, right? We should practice which is making excuses and not um, not presuming definitively that we know someone has an evil eye. We shouldn't do that. We should we should really be uh, aware of that um, because it's it, it reflects uh, you know we don't have knowledge of these things. These are unseen things, but we just have to be aware that they are real and that they can happen. And the best way to protect yourself is to of course do your protective duas like we you know before we started we do the, we did our word, which we're highly encouraged to do. You know, the Mu'adatayn, we, we seek protection from Allah, Ayat al-Kursi. These are the ways, and staying in a state of wudu, these are the ways that we protect ourselves from the effects of these harms, right? So that's what we should be doing, alhamdulillah. Is that the other end? Okay, mashallah. Okay, so we can um, we can stop and then uh, continue after prayer. It's a very, very valid point. And I think we have entered, obviously, a new era with all of this technology of, that if, you know gives us access, but I think we have to stick to our principles. It's just not really, it's not healthy. Like I, I've visited people's homes, and because of like, alhamdulillah, these teachings kind of being ingrained, I've left, and I don't know anything about that person's private home. Like I don't know the decorations. I won't remember. But then I know people who are like, oh, they're that painting or that their curtains were this color, and did you see this? And I was like, what? You're paying attention to that level? of detail like wow that's amazing but you know i think it's because yes we've we've we're very insecure and i think that's where it comes from it comes from insecurity you know when you go to people's homes with an agenda to try to find out details about their private life or just even to know what do they have what do they don't have that's that reeks of insecurity but if you're there to genuinely meet people and you want to see them then you're focusing on them and connection not their belongings, right, their possessions. So I think, um, you know, it's all uh, symptomatic of the world we live in, which is people have forgotten character as being, you know, a, a, a prime or, you know, um, as being a, a, a the, uh, the, what they should focus on so that that speaks of, of who you are and it's more about what you have, right? So your possessions, your accomplishments, your titles, um, how big your home is, how uh, how many children you have, and how good looking they are. Your trophy wife or husband starts to shape your value, right? Because in this society, that's how people are, you know, treated or judged. And I think that there's some truth to to that. The more we've uh, drifted away from really prioritizing character and and faith and these beautiful virtues we do, I think, look to people's other assets or, you know, things to, in order to kind of ass- suss them out, you know. Um, but that's not how it should be. It should really be, that those things are immaterial. <laughs> Anybody can have those things, but it's the heart that's the most prized possession, right? So, subhanAllah. <laughs> Right, because it's been normalized. And that's why normalization is so dangerous, you know, because if you're, you know, the company you keep or the what you allow to influence you will shape your perspective, right? So if you adopt the mentality that, oh, everybody else is doing it, then you're foregoing your own set of principles and values. We don't look to what's normalized or what the status quo is doing or what the majority is doing. We look to, is it halal and is it haram? Is it wrong? Is there potential danger to it. That's our criteria. But you have to be rationalizing and thinking on a higher level to do that. Most people, I think most of us have fallen into an automatic pilot 
way of existing. You know, we're on, you know, we're just barely doing the bare minimum. We're coasting. We're, you know, going from work to home life. And it's just like keeping up with the Joneses becomes, you know, the way that we operate. Like what's everyone else doing? Because I don't want to be ostracized, right, from groups. I want to be included. I want to keep my social circle. So if everybody's doing this, then I have to participate in that too. You know, like for example, a common trend that I think we we may have noticed in recent years is just these, the way that we celebrate milestones in life, right? Look at how much spending goes into our weddings, our birthdays, graduations, right? There's baby showers now, you know, bridal showers. There's an excuse to party for everything, but it's all about what? Is it really about bringing the hearts together or is it about showing right off and letting people know that you too can put on a really good party you know you too can entertain like you know and you're kind of whose party is the party of the of the year you know um and it's just this whole competition this competitive culture that i think we've created in order to present ourselves as having worth and i think that's a very dangerous precedent because Again, we're moving away from what our dean prioritizes, which is your character, your heart, um, how you know uh, mindful you are of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, how you uplift people. You know, and I think that's why also, I don't know. I find it like the more we have acquired all these things, and the more we have connection, you know, through social media. Ironically, we have less really strong relationships, right? A lot of people complain that they can't have, they don't have trusted friends anymore, or they've lost friends because, you know, they have a fallout. So our circles are actually getting smaller, like with real trust, you know, someone that you can, like, you know, entrust your life to, your soul, your secrets, you know, like how many of us really have those kinds of people in our lives? It's very difficult nowadays. So you might have a thousand friends on your social media, But how many of them would really, could you turn to as true companions, true people that have your back, you know, that wouldn't throw you under the bus? Because I've seen it. I mean, I know many, for example, I think one of the most horrific realities of our time, and I've had friends go through this, um, when a sister, for example, if, if a marriage doesn't last, right? I know many friends who, they lost friends because of the divorce, Like, people just turn their back on you. So you're like, okay, I lost my relationship. You have no idea, you know, about the details of that. But suddenly, I'm not worthy of your friendship anymore because the status of my marriage is different now. So you, you, a lot of sisters say they begin to be ostracized. They're no longer invited. They're judged. Their, Their spouses will even tell them, you know, don't hang out with her. She's divorced. I've heard that many times. And that's why, you know, if you see, like, Sana... Sister Sana, who had Wasila connections, her and I did a, a program several months ago on, you know, just the aftermath of divorce and how difficult it can be. So that's the kind of friends we have. Like, I don't want a friend like that who in my, like, fair weather friends, they want to come to your celebra- celebrations, but then when you're going through hardships, the presumption is uh, that you're the, you know, the problem. Based on what? Based on, you know, your own uh, diseases and your own you know, uh, but not any anything true. So I think my point is, is our friendships are so superficial. They're not real, which is ironic because you'd think with all the connecting we're doing, all the meetings we're doing, all the social networking we're doing, we would have more, uh, you know, friendships or, or meaningful relationships, but the quality matters. So yeah, if it's superficial, then you're likely going to have superficial friendships. So We shouldn't collect people. We should look to people who are really genuinely, you know, good companions in this life and who we feel are looking out for us. And those people aren't always going to have the maybe, um, you know, they're not always going to compliment you. They're not always going to tell you what you want to hear, but they will be truthful, right? I would take over, I would take a friend who's truthful with me and tells me like what I need to hear, even if it's bitter, as opposed to someone who's just, you know, faking it, platitudes, complimenting, superficial. That's not genuine companionship, you know. So I think it's a it's an unfortunate reality of our time. But this particular disease is so revealing because 
we need to first and foremost always look inwardly. Like, how much of these behaviors are we contributing? You know, how much of these, uh, you know, um, diseases are we uh, propagating because of our, uh, we're participating, right? We're, we're culpable. Unless we, like, social media is the easiest thing. If you're on social media and you just are there to peer into people's lives, you don't even post anything, you need to really get off of social media. If you're not actively on there trying to do something, like at least even benefiting people, like let's say you do follow really good people, like scholars and teachers, okay, then use it to benefit people, right? Share those things. But if it's like, because there's a lot of people who have these accounts, they don't even have a profile picture, nothing, a fake name, and they only use it to go and spy on other people. That's horrendous. That's like so unacceptable. Like To me, that's just really wrong on so many levels. Or multiple, yeah. Exactly. Well, what they call the Finsta, right? The fake Insta account. They actually have names for it. And a lot of the youth, you know, they know these things because that's how they get away with things with, uh, from their parents. But adults do it too. You'd be surprised. Um, and it's just a very dangerous thing to do for your heart. So envy, again, like most people when they hear of it, it's, we, we tend to, and I mentioned this I think last time too, but it's true of all the diseases, when we read them or read the descriptions or hear the descriptions, our mind usually goes to other people, right? Because that's the delusion of the nefs. And so we're always like, oh, yeah, that person, I know she has so much envy. <laughs> it's like, wait, did you hold the mirror up to yourself? Because you might be surprised that, subhanAllah, these things apply to you as well. So I'll read the next, uh, there's just a couple paragraphs left. And this is, a blessing, netma, is something that God bestows. One of God's names is Al-Mun'aim, the bestower of blessing, bestower of blessing. Envy, then, is to desire that a person lose whatever blessing God has given him or her. It is tantamount to saying that God should not have given this person a blessing, or worse yet, that he was wrong to do so, because I deserve it more. As the Imam says, it may reach the point that an enviar would himself remove the blessing if he were able to do so through some kind of ruse. However, what is perceived as a blessing could be based on a completely false notion, as one may desire something that in reality is nothing but trouble and difficulty. Conversely, there should be, excuse me, there could be a blessing hidden in something difficult. There is a well-known story about Al-Asma'i, the famous Arab philologist and compiler of poetry, when he once came upon a Bedouin and was invited to enter his tent. In Bedouin culture, the women serve guests in the presence of their husbands. This Bedouin had a very beautiful wife, though he himself was quite unattractive. When the men went out to prepare a lamb for a meal, the guest couldn't resist saying to this woman, How did such a beautiful woman like you marry such an ugly man like that? The woman said, Fear God. Perhaps he had done good works accepted by his Lord, and I am his reward. God is all wise in what he gives to people. If one questions the blessing of a, a person has received, then he or she is actually questioning the giver. This makes envy reprehensible and forbidden. So again, that's a powerful reminder that when we have envy, we're actually calling into question the distribution system of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, presuming that the one who's received it doesn't deserve it, and I deserve it. So it's very dangerous on so many levels because it's again accusatory in the worst way possible and we should always have the best opinion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and also realize that things aren't always as they appear right many people present themselves as though everything is great and it's usually to mask the reality that things are miserable right because they don't um, you know they're compensating so it's like they feel like everything, you know, in some cases, and I know people who've admitted this, that um, when things aren't going well in their lives, they'll put those messages out there because they feel exposed, you know. So it's kind of like a way of thwarting or projecting their insecurity in, in that way of, no, 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 everything's fine. So they'll put up like a picture of, let's say their relationship is not in a good place. Suddenly you see all these pictures of, you know, their past, oh, 10 years ago, my love, you know, did this for me. And it's like, why would, it's so random, right? But usually it's coming from a place of deep insecurity um, uh, projected in that way. So things aren't always as they assume, or, I mean, seem. And we should just know that 
the human nature is to sometimes cover things uh, by by you know doing things like that. So um, alhamdulillah, this chapter is quite long, and I don't think we're going to be able to uh, finish it uh, today. We're, we're going to have to do a part two. So um, I can read. There's, I guess we can read a little bit more. Um, the treatment, because the treatment is important. So I'll read uh, another section, and then we can stop and take any questions or comments from you guys, inshallah. So, as for the cure, it is to act contrary to one's caprice. For example, being beneficent to a person when it seems appealing to harm him, or praising him when you desire to find fault in him. Also, the cure is in knowing that envy only harms the envier. It causes him to be grievously, grievously preoccupied with his object of envy today, and tomorrow he is thereby punished. Moreover, envy never benefits the envier, nor does it remove from the one envied the blessing he has been given. So the treatment. Imam al prescribes two cures for envy. The first is to consciously act in opposition to one's caprice. The Arabic term here for caprice, hawa, is derived from the Arabic word that means to fall. It is also related to the Arabic word for wind. One's passion is like the wind in that it comes, stirs up emotion, and then dies down. One cannot really see it, only its effect. More often than not, following one's whims takes a person away from the truth. The history of humanity is replete with false notions that have come and gone. The truth, however, is something that is fixed and that can be recognized as such if one is truly objective. As for caprice, it has no foundation. For this reason, Imam Maulud says, one must resist his caprice. The Quran repeatedly warns against following one's caprice. It speaks of bygone communities who grew arrogant when God's messengers came to them with admonitions and teachings that did not agree with their soul's caprice. So they rejected the message and even killed the messengers, as mentioned in Quran chapter 5, verse 70. Also, God praises those who resist the caprices of their souls and promise them paradise. In chapter 79, 40, one of the names of hell mentioned in the Quran is Hawiya, in chapter 101, verse 9, which is derived from the same root as Hawa. Perhaps the connection is that a person enslaved to his whims descends into the depths of depravity in this life, and as a consequence, he faces perdition in the hereafter. As a remedy to the, to the type of envy that prods one to bring about harm to another person, Imam Maulud suggests that one contradict his temptation, that is, do something that will benefit the person who is envied. For example, give that person a gift or do a favor. This defies the commands of one's whims, gains the pleasure of God, and protects against envy. The Imam suggests also that one may praise the person toward, one whom, toward whom one feels the urge to slander. There is no hypocrisy in this recommendation. The purpose is to starve envy of the negative thoughts it requires to thrive. Being beneficent to a person against whom one feels envy often makes that person inclined towards the envier. In general, good people are inclined to love those who show them good. So, alhamdulillah, there's other treatments, but I think this is a good place to stop and also just to think about when we're struggling you know, to with emotions toward a person that we may have envy toward. Um, again, it's important to realize the nature of the nafs that you know these things um, are that, that our nafs, as you know, um, there's a sorry, I'm trying to remember the exact quote, but there's you know Sheikh Hamza, for example, he mentions that there's four uh, what he calls the four axes of evil, right? There's four evils in the world which are the nafs, shaitan, hawa, and dunya, the material world. And so to realize that all of these are, you know, obviously working against us and they're oppositions to what we should aspire, which is, inshallah, to be the best versions of ourselves. So when you start to realize that, you know, in your current circumstance, whatever it is that you're lacking or not lacking or that you want, that it's, you know, it's it's all immaterial at the end of the day because it's part of this dunya. This dunya is a low place. And maybe you want it now, but, you know, is it really something that's going to benefit you in the long run? In other words, just kind of having that perspective to not hold on to things to such a degree that they compromise your state with Allah, right? To kind of 
rationalize your emotional states when you see people have certain blessings that, you know what, sure, you know, that sounds good. Like if you, for example, have a car that's not really working well and you hear someone in your family got a brand new car. Again, you know, it sounds good, you know, to, to um, in, in, when, you, when you hear of another person's blessing that you would want that. But then you have to think about, well, they're, they're probably paying you know, extra payments. So it might be a burden, right? And whereas my car, alhamdulillah, it's old, but at least it gets me where I go. So you start to kind of just uh, magnify the blessings you have and minimize these things that just come and go. Because it's going to be this car today, but maybe later it'll be something else. And you kind of start to see the, the frivolity of it all. Like, right, that this is just the nature of the human being. We're never really satisfied with anything. We're always going through these you know, ebbs and flows of life and, and wanting this and wanting that. But we're, 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 we, ha- we should always, like, you know, redirect and reorient our hearts to what really matters, which is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So kind of, again, coming out of these emotional states and seeing that we are um, always, you know, being affected or prodded by either Iblis, our own nafs, hawa, dunya. Like, these forces are always, in a way, attacking us. And not to fall prey, you know, to see the trappings as they are, to kind of rise above it and just say, this is dunya, it's all temporal. What does it matter at the end of the day when nothing really lasts, right? If you really think about whatever blessing you have, I think that's one of the reasons why, I mean, even, you know, I've talked to children who kind of can rationalize this as well. Like this dunya, part of the, the um, what we sometimes forget is that it's temporal. Nothing is lasting here, right? So we invest all this time, all this energy, but then subhanAllah, Allah can take away something within a second. And this, there's many stories like this, you know, people losing their entire livelihood, their homes through a house fire, a, a flood, right? We saw it recently with the floods that were happening in Southern California, entire, you know, neighborhoods devastated by, by torrential rain or something else. So that's the nature of dunya, is that it's not going to last you. So even if, if you have something or you don't have something, not to give it so much weight and importance that it actually again, compromises your faith. So you, that, that's one way to really just um, have a, a clear understanding of, of this world and, and its temporality, and then to prioritize the next world. And then the other is when you're dealing with individuals or someone, to fight the negative thoughts, you know, and to actually force yourself. Like, let's say, and all I think, um, because we're mostly, I mean, we're women and like the, the people watching are mostly women, this is something that our world and then sometimes our cultures, we see other women sometimes as threats to us, right? So if a, if a beautiful woman were to enter a space and she is decked out from head to toe, right? Every single woman who's looking at her will immediately feel very insecure in herself, right? We'll all look at her because she's beautiful. Allah has given her jamal. She's maybe dressed uh, beautifully. She carries herself a certain way. And so in that moment, the hasad or the, this, these feelings may come up, right? Where you just want to find fault in her. And you, I, you know, I've, I've been in situations where I've seen people actually start, you know, saying things, a'udhu billah, because they can't deal with the, with the feelings that are coming up for them. So they have to make some comment. Like, oh, who does she think she is? Or, oh, you know, look at her. You know? So these are all reflections of this disease. But You know, an example of this is when you see someone who enters a space like that, instead of immediately making it about you and feeling insecure compared to her, just see that person as, you know, she's from Allah, like Allah created her in her beauty, right? And force yourself to recognize the one who created her, the fashioner of that person, right? Because she didn't obviously make herself, right? I mean, yes, nowadays with plastic surgery, that's arguable, but... But, uh, you know, Allah is the one who designed her, who fashioned her, who created her, who made her. So you can just stop for a moment and say, MashaAllah, Tabarakallah, Allah gave her jamal. Now, does that mean she's perfect? No, she likely has other issues. We're all deficient in some ways. We have, uh, you know, shortcomings and we also have blessings. But the point is, is to fight the urge to try to find some flaw in her or anyone. Like when you go somewhere and let's say your claim to fame is that you cook very well. You know, you're invited to someone and maybe the dish that you always get credit for, someone else comes and their dish is more delicious. And everybody's like, oh, wow, this is the best, you know, whatever, biryani or, you know, uh, cake or whatever it is that you bake or make. 
if if the compliments are going to that person instead of feeling threatened, right? To just be like, Alhamdulillah, you know, Allah's given her that skill, good for her. To truly mean it. Like, I'm happy that you are successful and not to make it about you. That nafsiness that takes other people's blessings and personalizes it and makes it about you is something that we should feel gross about. Like, there's this, it's something we shouldn't, we should detest and we should want to purge. And the way you do that is by recognizing the the and directing the the praise not to the individual but to the one who enabled them with that you know which is back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so you, that's where the compliment mashallah tabarakallah you know it's very good you look very beautiful these types of compliments that we can bring out are really inshallah they should come from a heart that wants to remove these feelings because if you are fighting these thoughts then you don't fall under the description of someone who has envy it's the one who not only does it with impunity, without even thinking of it, and, um, and uh, you know, makes everything, as I said, about themselves that really has this disease. But fighting these thoughts and really working against the self is how we, inshallah, purge. So um, I think these are, these, this is a good place to stop. But any, any comments or questions, inshallah, we have about, about 10 minutes or so. Got it. So possessiveness. Yeah. Yes, possessiveness. So the question was about Feeling may, pos- may be possessive towards, uh, you know, a, someone where you covet them, you want them for yourself, you maybe even feel threatened if someone else comes into the picture. I mean, obviously every relationship, um, especially the closer we are to people, we may feel those things. But I think when we, um, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us uh, two things that come to mind. Uh, lem- uh, first is, um, oh, astaghfirullah. Sorry, I'm forgetting my, my, my verses right now, my hadith. But, but one of them is that when we are, um, sorry, la inshaqatum la azidanikum. So when you are grateful, right, for something, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala increase you in that blessing. So your gratitude, you know, for the blessing should, should, uh, should emerge in those situations instead of feeling threatened, right? Because if you're grateful for the blessing, then you want to pay it forward. You want to share. You want people to benefit, right? So if you have a really great friend and they've been, you know, good to you and you feel like they're such a blessing, then show your gratitude by, yes, protecting it, but also wanting not to covet it for just yourself, right? Because some people have that ability. I mean, I have, mashallah, beautiful people, even teachers that I feel like I want the world to know about, right? Because they've benefited me so much. So it's kind of like, it's a way of show, expressing your gratitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then you'll find that when you have that, um, it's a scarcity mindset, right, versus the the uh, growth mindset, that when you have the, the mindset that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is so generous and kind to have given me this great friend, and alhamdulillah, I don't feel threatened by it because someone else is into the picture, and you have that type of, a, I think, attitude, then you'll find that your relationship, I think, is strengthened by that, right? But when we start to become possessive and jealous and we play these little mind games, I feel like there's an insecurity there, and we should be uh, like, look, what what is inspire what what co- what is inspiring that insecurity? Is it that I feel I'm not like uh, that that someone else can replace me, right? And and maybe this friend that's so special is going to suddenly be swept away by someone else. And if that's the case, and you want to work on maybe being the best friend that you can to that person, so that you are <laughs> irreplaceable, right? That they would never feel that way about you. Uh, so I think, you know, there's a few different ways to approach it. But most importantly is to remember Allah gave the, the friend to you. And if you want to hold on to that relationship, then the best thing to do, like with any blessing, is just to be very grateful for it. Because the more we're grateful for the blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the more he secures those blessings and increases those blessings. And not to um, to start to draw lines. And I've seen, I personally, uh, in my uh, relationships, I've always told my friends, like, that's actually a sure where, sure Far away to to um, negatively affect the relationship is if you start to become too possessive, because I feel like we it just complicates things and it it becomes um, I mean there's a fine line obviously where people really are you know very committed and they love and that's just their expression of love but when it becomes emotionally enmeshed to the point where it's now it's it's an unhealthy attachment then I think it's it just doesn't go very well right because then there's expectations and now it's like oh you went to this and I wasn't invited and there's jealousy and there's competition so I don't feel like those are 
good emotions that we should romanticize, you know, between whether it's couples or friends in general, like the possessiveness. I think it's not a healthy um, thing. We can certainly be uh, loyal and have fidelity and love in all of our relationships, but there should always be a very um, clear boundary. Because to be honest, this world is, is a difficult place and I've seen people lose themselves, you know, because they were too attached. So that in every relationship, you should have a very a healthy distance, you know. So I know it's a long answer to your question, but, <laughs> you know, because I, I feel like these notions are sometimes over-romanticized, you know, like, oh, you know, th this is my best friend. And it's like, you know, we're not in high school. Yeah, let's mature, let's grow up and, and look at people as just... Um, I mean, like the Prophet Sallallahu he had his companions and everyone knew, you know, who they were. There's that one hadith, I forget which sahaba it was, but he was, you know, because the Prophet had the ability to make everyone feel very special and close to him. And so one of the sahaba asked him, like, who's your favorite person? And he, he mentions, like, Sayyidina Abu Bakr. He goes through all these people and, like, by number five or six, he's still not mentioned. And then he's like, okay, okay, I'm good. Because he realized, like, this is hurting me now, right? So sometimes wanting to be number one or, you know, in someone's world, um, especially if they have like that magnanimous personality type or are very loving, is it might just, I think it's, a, it's not necessary. Rather you see them as being, um, you know, signs of God, you know, especially if they're very good people and want that everybody benefit from them, inshallah. And then just do your part to be a very good friend and a loyal friend to them. And inshallah, you, you'll never lose them. No, it's absolutely on point. And, and, you know, as you mentioned, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who distributes. He's the source of all blessings. So he knows what we all need at the time of our, you know, at whatever time we're in. And, and maybe at, you know, different intervals in our lives or different periods of our lives, we may feel abundance. Other times things may be withheld from us. But it's all, inshallah, for our betterment. And if we can accept that and then understand that every other person has the same experience, then we stop fixating on the particulars and just see that everyone's being tested. And that's why, you know, that famous story of, of Ibn Atayla and his teacher, Sheikh Abu Abbas al-Mursi, where he talks to him about, you know, just the burden of the dunya, that he can't deal with it. And then he tells him, I'll tell you something and if you understand it, you will, it'll help you. And he goes on to explain to him that all people are being tested, every single person. Um, and there's four different states that the, that the human beings fall under, right? So the first is that they're in blessing. And if they're in blessing, then their test is that they have to have gratitude. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is looking to see whether or not they're being grateful. But that is a test for them. So a person could be filthy rich and have all these great things, but we could perceive it like, oh, they have it it's so easy, right? And that's where envy comes from. It's like, oh, they have it so easy, I don't have those things. But they're actually being tested. Wealth is a huge... Um, amana and it's a burden in many ways right so that's your first state and then the second is that you are um, in tribulation right that you have problems it could be in your health it could be in your relationships it could be in your work it could be in your home it could be wherever but if you're being tested in a with a tribulation a real difficulty that's not in your faith right it's in the world it's in a worldly sense then your test is that you have patience that you have sabr and jimmy the beautiful patience and it is your test, right? So you're on your path to Allah. The person in blessing is on their path to Allah. But everybody's being tested simultaneously. And then the two remainder are that you're either in guidance, hidayah, or you're in misguidance. And those two also have tests. If you're in guidance, like alhamdulillah, we're Muslim, we're, we're being guided. But we're being tested as well in the guidance. And the test is, do you um, have the humility to know, right, that your guidance is from God? And to not fall into that self-righteousness where you think like you're better than people, right? The superiority mindset that a lot of believers can fall into. That your guidance is, is in whatever um, things that you've been able to accomplish or achieve, your knowledge, whatever you've done, is directly from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's not from you. Right? It's not because of your efforts that you are at a certain level of piety or righteousness. So that's, you know, the third. And then the fourth is misguidance and the test is to make toba and to repent that you you know free yourself of of the uh, sin sinfulness and that you return to Allah so the point of this is to is to say that 
in order to fight these diseases is that you start to have that, you know, zoom out, look at the world as a place of tests and tribulation where all of God's creation have their journey to him. And then the details of other people, which is why we're ta told to mind our own business, become inconsequential because it doesn't matter what they have or what they don't have. I have to think about me. I am going to, I, just as I was brought into this world by myself, I will be returned to the grave by myself. I will be risen on the day of judgment by myself. I have to be worried about me. So the preoccupation and the distraction of what other people have and don't have is from shaitan. It's from nafs. It's all to throw you off the path so that you fail. And that's why we have to reject that, right? So going back to those four sources of evil, just start to see that it's all so, you know, it's, it's baseless. I'm giving weight to things that don't matter at the end of the day. Like a person's, as I said, their bank account, their house, their beauty, their lineage, all those things that we are like, oh, at the end of the day, they're going to end up in, in the same predicament that we all are. Same predicament. We're going to die. We're going to leave this material world. And we will rise to stand before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it's about whether we get our account in our right hand or our left hand. And, and the rest will know. You know. That's the most important thing. And to not uh, you know, magnify these minutia of dunya that are designed to, as I said, throw us off our, our, our path. So there's a lot more to be said, but jazakallah khairan. To all of you, inshallah, we'll continue. How about that one minute to spare? We'll continue this discussion on envy because there is more about the treatments that and uh, and some of the ways envy manifests and also leads to other diseases that we should know about because um, it is a big one in our time. So we'll end in du'a, inshallah. Bismillah <clears> ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Wa la asr inna l-insan la fi khusr illa ladina amanu wa amilu salihati wa tawasu bil haqq wa tawasu bil sabr. سبحانك اللهم وبحمدك نشهد أن لا إله إلا أنت نستغفرك ونتوب إليك اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على سيدنا ومولانا وحبيبنا محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا سبحان ربك رب العزة أما يصفون وسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين الحمد لله جزاك الله خيرا thank you everyone inshallah